Hey guys, how are ya? Just relax, cousin. Uh oh. <clears throat> What's happening, cousin? What's up, cousin? Sorry. Sorry, guys. Let me just send this to my angels to my daughters. I'll be seeing you in all. Let me see. Let's see. Yep, I'm live. Man, why am I such a handsome young man? Let me just do this. Okay, let me just see. Sorry about that. Just telling Baba is live. Telling the girls watch. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Just letting you know. All right. How you doing, everybody? How are you doing? Good to see you on this Mother's Day. <clears throat> I'm assuming that you guys are home because of the lockdown, COVID-19. So I'm, I'm assuming you had some time with your mothers if they're with you. Those of you who, like me, <clears throat> who have lost their mothers, we trust and believe that they died in Jesus Christ, in union with Jesus Christ, born of the love of Jesus by the Spirit, so they're in glory, more alive than us, worshiping Jesus, right? <clears throat> so, yeah, my mother went to be with the Lord. Here, let me share a story with you guys. Okay, good. Uh, how are you, brother? Uh, Chris Dino, more attacks today. Chris Dino, let me share something with you, my brother. Every time I'm about to do something big by the grace of Jesus Christ, Every time the Holy Spirit has me do something big for the glory of Christ, and not just me, any one of us, Chris Dino, like David Wood, I know I'm going to get attacked that day. Something's going to happen where Satan's going to attack me to try to discourage me emotionally in order to handicap me from doing what the Spirit <clears throat> has set us apart to do. But you know what's amazing, Chris Dino? Glory to Jesus Christ because he's almighty. And Satan is a creature under the feet of Jesus. Glory to Jesus Christ. He fails every time because we still get the job done by the power of the Holy Spirit. So today, more trauma, more emotional attacks by Satan using unregenerate, immoral, evil human agents who don't fear God. And yet think they are righteous. They think they are Christians. And they think they are under God's favor and that God is judging me. Even though they're the ones who sin and shame the Lord. And they're always the victims. Everyone else is the villain. So that's what happens. So guys, you don't understand how much your prayers are important for us. I need you to pray more, fast more for my daughters and I that Jesus sanctifies us, purifies anything in me that needs to be purified because there's a lot. To help me to let go and heal my heart and rest in him knowing he fights for my daughters. And that I need to just trust in him that in time the Lord Jesus will reveal the truth and we'll be together. So I do need your prayers. David Wood needs your prayers, right? Al Fadi needs your prayers. <clears throat> Jay Smith needs your prayers. Because rest assured. And here, you want proof? You want more proof? An additional Line of evidence, how real God is, how real the spirit realm is, how real Satan is. Do full-time ministry. Start full-time ministry. Devote yourself entirely to ministry and watch all hell break loose around you as a testimony. Satan is real, the kingdom of darkness is real, and God is real. If you had any doubts about it, start doing full-time ministry. In fact, who was it that told me? Somebody told me. Wow, Lopez, I'm sorry to hear that, man. God have mercy on you. God have mercy. Pray for Lopez. It says that they never found his wife's murder, so his wife got murdered. But she's alive in the presence of Jesus Christ, and the Lord Jesus will vindicate her. Someone told me, who was it? Maybe he's here. Someone told me that even an atheist hearing the trials of David Wood and hearing my story, he goes, man, hearing their story <clears throat> makes you believe that there is Satan. Satan is real. Because how do you explain the stuff they go through? Someone is telling me an atheist was even saying that, right? 
So, but glory to God. I, I, I know God sustains me. Jesus is alive. I know the Lord Jesus has mercy on me and my daughters. And I know that he responds to the prayers and the fasting of his beloved, the church. So keep praying for us, for the glory of Christ, right? <clears throat> Love you too, Michael Popes. So welcome, everyone. I don't know how many people are going to have today. Glory to God, we had a good crowd for David Wood, 1,500. 1,500. I barely break 270, but in time, for his glory, in Jesus' name. But I don't know how many we're going to have today. It's Mother's Day. And usually I like to live stream around 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to allow for the people in the U.K. to join the discussion. But anyway, with that said, it's it's Mother's Day, and I just want to acknowledge, and I did this on Facebook. So if you're not on my Facebook, check it out. I have two accounts, Ben Malik and Sam Shimon. The reason why I have two accounts is because they were blocking Sam Shimon. They put me on trial where for 30 days I couldn't text, right? Muslims were <clears throat> using Facebook to silence us, right? So I started an alternate account called Ben Malik. Ben Malik, B-E-N-M-A-L-I-K, -E as Holy Spirit loosens my tongue and clears my throat in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Okay, now, if you want to be updated when I go live or if you want to be updated when I publish and post new articles, find my account, Sam Shimon, Ben Malik, but then let me know who you are. Say, hey, I'm one of those guys that watches you, and I'm sending a friend request so I can be updated when you go live and when you publish new articles, right? <clears throat> On my Facebook, I acknowledged... And I want to acknowledge it here. I want to honor and cherish, in my estimation, in my estimation, the greatest mother God ever created, the greatest woman God ever created, the one woman who gave birth to her son, a son that is older than her, a son who created her, a son who gave her life, and a son who chose her to be his mother. And I'm talking about the blessed, beloved, beautiful mother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our mother by faith in Jesus Christ, the beloved mother of the Lord Jesus, the blessed and holy Mary, right? I want to honor her and cherish her. And the reason why is because we love, we ch cherish we adore and honor and worship Jesus as our God and Savior. And we love those whom Jesus loves. And you better believe it. And I don't care what tradition you come from. I'm not being, right? I'm not being Catholic or Orthodox or Protestant. I'm being a Biblicist. My commitment is to the authority of Scripture. When the Bible teaches something, I accept it. And that's my prayer, that the Holy Spirit will guide me into all truth. And remove all <clears throat> blindfolds, all hinder hindrances, all shackles, and enable me to be free to accept the Bible as it is and live it out by his power for the glory of Jesus. So, Mary is an amazing woman, and I call her woman out of respect and honor because she was given the grace and the privilege that no woman will ever receive. She was chosen by the triune Godhead, set apart out of the grace, love, and mercy of the triune Godhead to be the vehicle that would conceive the physical body and the human nature of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you better believe that Jesus Christ loves and adores his mother. I may do a session on what we can know and learn about the Blessed Mother, the Beloved Mother of our Lord Jesus, our Mother, Mary, from the New Testament. Not much is said, but what is said is sufficient to show us how highly honored she is in the sight of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, I'm being biblical here. Don't say, oh, you're becoming Catholic Orthodox. No, I'm being biblical. I'm giving her the honor she deserves for being the Mother of the eternal word of the Father, the eternal Son of the Father, the very heart of the Father who became f flesh from her blessed 
sanctified womb. Now, here's what's shocking about our Lord Jesus Christ. Exactly, Pedro. And I'm going to begin a word of prayer, and hopefully we get the regular crowd. And we'll focus on Hebrews 1 so we can deal with the heretics and their distortion of the book of Hebrews and the New Testament as a whole. Now, <clears throat> here's what's shocking about Jesus. You guys ready? And pray that the Lord Jesus will strengthen my throat because I'm not young anymore. I'm getting older. And as I get older, I'm not as strong or vigorous as I used to be. I used to be able to speak for hours and my throat would still be strong. I'm getting old. Ladies, I'm getting old. I'm going to be 48 if God wills. If the Lord is pleased to extend my earthly life, I'm going to be 48 September 14. All right? And I'm not young. Right? But anyway. Well, in light of ever, eternity, I am quite young. But here's what's astonishing about our Lord. Now, remember, Jesus is God who became man. He has two natures. He has a divine nature and a human nature. Now, folks, pay attention. He's one eternal person. He has a divine nature and a human nature. Now, folks, pay attention to this. Pay attention to this. As God, Jesus has a father, no mother. As man, Jesus has a mother, no father. Did that sink in? She wanted to sink in. <clears throat> Before I proceed. As God, Jesus has a father, but no mother. God is his father. As man, he has a mother, no father, because no human father sired him. Now you tell me, isn't that amazing? A truly unique person who, as God, being an eternal person, has a father but no mother. But then who chose to become human and, as man, has a human mother but no father. That's how amazing Jesus Christ is. Magdalene. Wow. I am so sorry to hear that. Guys, pray for Magdalene. Her brother left this earth on September 14th, my birthday and entered glory, the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is my birthday going to be a stumbling block to you, Magdalene? Or is that maybe a sign of the Lord's grace and mercy? I don't know. How do you take that, sister? Wow, man. How do you take that? I don't know. I'm just like shocked right now. Okay. But Magdalene, I'm going to give you something similar to me. Okay? Similar. Not identical, but similar. Folks, pray that we keep getting that 250 here coming. I know it's Mother's Day, so I know it's a little later and we won't have as many. S uh, sister, if you're not comfortable talking about it, forgive me. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but anyway. How old was he? How old was he? And I'm going to give you a story similar, not identical, but how old was the young man? I'm assuming he was a young man. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe my birthday is a sign, a sign of blessing. I don't know. I'm just curious. Hold on. She, you know, pray for our sister. She too has been through a lot. Pray for her and her two beautiful daughters. The Lord Jesus watch over her. If it's personal, let me know. I won't ask. Sorry if I'm putting you on the spot because I'm going to share a story with you, Magdalene. My firstborn, the one who made me a father. Okay. She was born. Oh, all right. He's in glory, Magdalene. He's alive. And I pray God will use me. Because remember, I, I pray I'm a servant of Jesus, used of Jesus to be a blessing in your life. Maybe that's God's way of letting you know September 14 is not heartbreaking. Because here's a servant of the Lord born on that day as a reminder that Jesus is real. He loves you. He's in love with you. And your brother is alive because he cannot die because Jesus is alive. And your brother is in his presence. You just got to believe and trust because Christ is risen. He's alive. Now, Magdalene, I'm going to give you a similar story with mine. Are you ready to hear my story? My oldest daughter, my firstborn, my precious firstborn, I have two beautiful angels. Like you have two beautiful angels. You have two daughters, I have two daughters. Okay. Now, my, my firstborn was born March 12, 2010. Four years later, March 12, 2014, the Lord Jesus was pleased to take my mother home in glory. Notice when my mother passed away. She passed away on my firstborn's fourth birthday. It wasn't a coincidence. You guys are hearing this? My daughter was born March 12, 2010. March 12, 2014, a Wednesday. The Lord took my mother in glory when my daughter turned four. 
Do you know why, Magdalene? And I knew. I even told my ex-wife. My wife, my mother was in the hospital, and I knew she was going to pass away that week. And I knew she was going to pass away on my daughter's birthday, on Wednesday. It was Wednesday. Do you know why that happened? Because I knew the Lord used my daughter to comfort me. Every time I want to think about my mother and her leaving, I'm reminded of my daughter and my heart is filled with joy and love because I can tell you that after Jesus was pleased to reveal himself to me and by his spirit helped me to know him and love him, the greatest gift that the Lord has given me, humanly speaking on earth, is the gift of my two daughters. I could not ask for more beautiful girls than them, girls that are adorable, that have snatched their father's heart. And my pain and agony is for them, right? I get angry for them. I get sad for them because I don't want anything to harm them, right? And you guys know if you're parents. So, so maybe in a way, my birthday, who knows? Maybe that was the Lord trying to remind you. Sam is a Christian, and I believe I am, and I'm a servant of the Lord, who preaches the gospel, used by the Spirit to reassure people the Bible is God's word. Christ is risen, and those who die in Christ are alive. So take that as a reminder. Your brother lives because Jesus lives. Yes. So keep our sister in prayer. You're crying, Timothy? Amen. If your tears are because the Holy Spirit is using me to speak the words of Jesus, and those words are punishing your heart to fall in love with Jesus, hallelujah. That's my goal in these sessions. That's my goal in these sessions. My goal is that the Spirit will use me to cause people to fall more in love with Jesus and help me fall more in love with Jesus and live for him and have no doubt he's real and to trust him. Now, Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Son, Son of the Most High, we love you. Heart of the Father, become flesh, we love you. Lord Jesus, you are the Father's heart, become flesh. And Holy Spirit, we love you. Eternal Spirit, we adore you. We trust you. We depend on you. Holy Spirit, have your way with this session. Fill my lungs and my chest and throat with life from your presence and anoint my mouth to speak clearly without error and save me from stammering and confusion. And Holy Spirit, illuminate everyone here with wisdom and knowledge from your presence and fill us with your life and give us the grace to become more like Jesus and bring more people for the glory of Jesus to listen and bless these sessions and strengthen the internet connection. Holy Spirit, because everything good, even internet, when we use it lawfully for the glory of Christ, is a gift of your grace. O Holy Spirit of the Father and of the Son, the Lord Jesus. Save us from attacks of the enemy and his children. Remove all distractions and mortify our flesh and be with our loved ones. In my case, my daughters. Heal them. Save them from irreparable damage and save them from godless examples. And help me to trust in you, Holy Spirit, to do a work in them and in me to bring us together. Because you are God and you are almighty. And help me not to harm them, but to be Jesus to them. And Holy Spirit, I ask for a special anointing and blessing upon everyone here who's lost a loved one. Whether a mother that's in glory or a father or a child or a sibling. Holy Spirit, you know who they are, such as our sister Mary, I'm sorry, Magdalene. Holy Spirit, Magdalene, bless her heart, comfort her heart, fill her with your inexpressible joy, love, and peace. And everyone who is hurting now because they've lost someone. And Holy Spirit, remind them how real Jesus is. And he's alive. And those who are dead are not dead. They're alive to Christ. And destroy our fears and our doubts and our unbelief. And again, Holy Spirit, have your way in this session and loosen my tongue. To speak only that which you want me to speak for the glory of Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. We love you, Son of God, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, help us to love Jesus more. We love you, Father. Holy Spirit, help us to be in love with the Father. And to be more like Jesus. In Jesus' name, Yehovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yehovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yehovah. I'm going to block you from my Facebook and my phone because you obviously don't follow my Facebook page because I announce when I'm going live and I'm live streaming and I got you on record and they're hearing this. What is it about your bad habit of calling me when I'm live streaming? Do you care about my ministry and my live streams? I do. So do you read my announcements on Facebook that I'm going live? No, because it's your world. Listen, my friend, it's your world because you're French and you think you own the world. Like you're French croissant and I'm just a squirrel. I'll call you when I'm done. I'll call you. Okay. okay. You little sinner, man. All right. Take care. Sorry about that. Don't you love these live streams?
All right. That was a fellow apologist. I'll tell you who it was. It was Alex Blagojevich. He's a French apologist who loves Jesus, and he apologizes for being a nuisance. The one reason why he became an apologist is so that he can apologize for being a nuisance. Hey, guys, is it just me? And you think I'm, you're going to think I'm boasting now. I'm not. Is it just me, or do I look stunningly handsome today, and I look leaner? If, it is, if it's true, I'm not deceiving myself. Glory to Jesus. Everything good is from him. <whistles> Sam, you're a gorgeous beast. If I was a woman, I would propose. Ow! All right. Are we ready? Are mods here? Are we ready to begin? Pray I don't become a nuisance to my neighbors and not be too loud. You want me to do it again? Okay, here you go. Kara said flex your picks. Guys, I have to get back in the gym and get muscles. I have no muscles anymore. What you're seeing is muscle memory. It's, I'm scared I'm going to get amnesia or Alzheimer's, and my muscles will lose all their mem memory. No matter what you do, I'm going crazy. I'd rather be alone. Yeah. My heart skips a beat every time we meet. I don't know what to do. All right, there. Okay, are we ready? Why not growing? Did I did I cause you to stumble, sister? I don't want to be a stumbling block to you. Here, I'll speak Greek to you. Tikanis, kesikala. What's going on, Eddie? All right, folks, let's focus because I want to dismantle the Jehovah Witness distortion of Scripture using Hebrews one to show that Jesus is Jehovah God in the flesh. Hey, Azul, Luza, I'm doing intermittent fasting where I can eat and not gorge myself. I'm not going to cut off cereals completely. I'm going to cut back for now for a little while. Stop imposing your will on me, friend. It's not your world. Okay? It's Anna's world. It's Hepsa's world. It's Magdalene's world. And you're just a squirrel. Okay. Thank you, King. I like that. Okay. Is Protestant here or he's not here? Is it first and last? Because I think Protestant may be spending time with his wife. Right? Okay. That's Teasu San T. Uh, Thank you, I Iwana. Iwana. All right, first last, can you post for me, bro? Can you post? Yeah. You want me to repeat that, Hapsa? Khali and Shwaribach. I will eat your whiskers. Okay, folks, let's begin. Hebrews 1 testifies that Jesus Christ is Jehovah God Almighty. How does it do so? Remember, this is part two. You need to go back and listen to part one. And part of my exposition will also bring up translations again. So guys, focus. Help me to help you. Stay focused so you don't get confused. Lord willing, tomorrow I'll try to speak about John 3, 5. What does it mean when our Lord says, be born of water and spirit? Okay, now let's go to Hebrews chapter 1. Let's read. We're going to read verses 8 to 12. Hebrews 1, verses 8 to 12. Can you can you use the Jehovah's Witness translation or should we? Yeah, let's use the Jehovah's Witness translation. Okay, first and last if possible. We're going to use the Joe's Witness translation for our purposes. Guys, do pay attention to see the point I'm making. Yep, and do hit the like button. But about the son, he says, about the son, he says, guys, pay attention. About the son, he says, God is your throne forever and ever, and the scepter of your kingdom is the scepter of uprightness. You love righteousness and you hated lawlessness. That is why God, your God, anointed you with the oil of exaltation more than your companions. Now, verses 10 to 12. And at the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. And just like a garment, they will all wear out, and you will wrap them up just as a cloak and as a garment, and they will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will never come to an end. Now watch this. We're going to quote this one more time because here's where you need to get in the saddle and focus. In Hebrews 1, verses 8 to 12, the author, inspired by the Holy Spirit, has the Father glorifying the Son Jesus, praising the Son Jesus in the words of specific Old Testament passages. Let me repeat what's happening here because we're going to have to look at it. And if you don't get the point, then you won't be able to make your case. And I'm using the Jehovah's Witness Bible for a reason. Okay. Now, tradition says Paul wrote Hebrews using an amanuensis, meaning a scribe. 
I have no reason to reject that tradition, but I know there are people who reject it. I know Michael Peps did a video in which he's arguing Paul didn't write it. That's okay. Whoever wrote it, he was used of the Holy Spirit and he was writing inspired scripture. But it is an ancient tradition that says Paul wrote Hebrews, right? In fact, here's what's ironic. Side note. How many Catholics in the chat? How many Catholics in the chat? Okay. Come on, Kath. Don't worry. I'm not here to bash you guys. Don't be scared. I'm not attacking you. Catholics. Okay. Azul. All right. Okay. Do you know that at the Council of Trent in 1546, which Catholics believe was an infallible uh, council, Hebrews was attributed to Paul? Do you know that? Hebrews was attributed to Paul. Do you know that? That means... The official position of the Roman Catholic Church until modern, liberal, unbelieving scholarship crept in and poisoned some of the priests, bishops, and cardinals. The official position of the Catholic Church is Paul wrote 14 letters by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. One of those letters is the letter to the Hebrews. Do you know that? I'll call you guys in a minute. I'm live streaming. So I'll call you guys. We'll talk. Did you know that? Uh, another related issue. For those of you who believe the King James is the perfect translation of God's words in English, how many of you read the King James only? Here we go again. Here goes Jesus. And here we go. Another guy. Guys, get rid of these demons. Okay. Did you know that the King James translators believe Hebrews was written by Paul? Do you know that you'll see in the subscription a letter to the Hebrews by St. Paul? That was also the position of the King James translators. Do you know this? Everyone understand this? You, got, you know or you didn't know this. So it's an ancient tradition, and it is the official tradition of the Roman Catholic Church, and it was the belief of the King James translators. Paul wrote Hebrews. Right? Yes, the Eastern Church believed that Anagroin. The Eastern Church believed it, which is why the Western Church eventually accepted Hebrews, because they had some debates around, regarding its authorship. So what's my point? You have a very ancient tradition, a tradition I didn't accept at first, but now I have no reason to belie it, that Paul wrote Hebrews using a scribe. And there are some Christians today who believe that the scribe that he used may have been Luke, because the Greek of Hebrews is very polished. It's on the level of the Greek of Luke and Acts. Gee, thank you, Joseph. I would have lost sleep if you thought I wasn't your brother in Christ because I hold to the King James. I would have lost sleep and gave up on ministry. Okay, now, put this aside now. Understand the point I'm trying to make with Hebrews. Okay, Hebrews, Hebrews, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has the Father, pay attention, this is powerful, guys. God the Father Almighty, glorifying and praising Jesus in the words of Old Testament texts that the Father quotes about the Son, showing the Son is God Almighty. You understand what I'm about to prove? You understand what I'm about to prove? Okay. With that said, let's use the Jehovah Witness perversion of the Bible to demonstrate that again. Okay, let's now pay attention now. Who's speaking? The Father. Who's the Father speaking to? The Son. Who's the Father speaking about? The Son. So pay attention. The Father is speaking to the Son about the Son. Notice what he says to the Son and about the Son. Are you ready? He went ahead and posted it before I told him to post it. Are you ready? I want to make sure you're ready before I move on. Ready? Okay. Now, if you're ready, then pay attention. The Father is speaking to the Son and about the Son. Okay. Hebrews 1, verses 8 to 12. Pay attention. Because what we're going to focus on is verses 10 to 12. Hebrews 1, verses 8 to 12. But about the Son, he says. Who says? The Father. 
God the Father says this about the Son. What does he say? God is your throne forever and ever, and a scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You love righteousness and you hated lawlessness. That is why God, your God, anointed you with the oil of exaltation more than your companions. Now notice what the Father is going to say to the Son now. The Father is still speaking to the Son. Verse 10, what does the Father say to the Son? And at the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. Pay attention to what you just read. The Father said to the Son, He said to the Son, You, Son, are the Lord who at the beginning laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens were made by your hands, my son. The heavens are the work of your hands, my son. Notice what the Father goes on to say. They will perish, but you will remain. And just like a garment, they will all wear out. And you will wrap them up, my son, just as a cloak, as a garment, and they will be changed. But you, my son, because the Father is still speaking to the Son, are the same, and your years will never come to an end. And this is the Jehovah Witness Bible. Did you catch what Hebrews says? The Father said to the Son, Son, you are the Lord, who at the beginning of creation laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will wear out, and like a garment, you will wrap them up. Right? They will wear out, but you remain the same, and your years never end. Do you understand what the Father just said about the Son? The Father just glorified the Son, praised the Son as the eternal, unchangeable creator and sustainer of all creation. Do you understand what you just read? The Father just glorified, praised the Son for being the Lord who created all creation, who sustains all creation, and unlike creation, he remains the same. He's unchangeable. Yep, that's their Bible. We're using the Jehovah's Witness Bible, which you can read online for free, www.jw.org. No, atheist. The Father calls the Son Jehovah. He didn't call him God. He called him Jehovah. And I'll show you that in a minute. Now, are you ready to see what psalm the Father quoted about the Son? Because in Hebrews 1, 10 to 12, there the Father is quoting an Old Testament psalm. Are you now ready to see what psalm the Father quoted about the Son? Who's ready? We're going to use the Jehovah's Witness Bible. Ron here is so excited that he went to Psalm 102, 25, 27, which doesn't make his case if he ignores his verse 1 and 12 and 18 to 22. But that's what you have, what happens when you're on here. He's not patient. Okay, Anna, this is what he's quoting. Let's go to the Jehovah Witness Bible. We're going to read. I'm going to post it for you guys. The Greek version is Psalm 101. No, Keras. Stuck for a lot of blood. No, not Psalm 45. Not Psalm 45. The Greek version is Psalm 101, but here's what we're going to quote. Psalm 102, verse 1, verse 12, verse 18 to 22, and 24 to 27. Here it is. We're going to quote Psalm 102, verse 1, verse 12, verses 18 to 22, and verses 24 to 27. Be patient, guys. I know you're excited to try and impress me. Don't impress me. I don't get impressed easily. The only person that impresses me is Magdalene. Just kidding. Psalm 102, verse 1, 12. Let's read. Guys, read. Jehovah Witness Bible. O Jehovah, O Jehovah, hear my prayer. Let my cry for help reach you. But you remain forever, O Jehovah, and your fame will endure for all generations. This is the Jehovah Witness Bible. Okay. Reverend Dr. Chester R. Cook. You know you're going to have to leave my channel right now, right, brother? Sorry. You know I'm gonna. you're going to have to leave my channel? For making a very stupid argument that just because there's no J in Hebrew or in Greek, somehow it means we shouldn't be using J when talking about Jesus. Do you call Jesus Jesus or you call him Isis? Why are you making a mountain out of a molehill? Why are you distracting us with such stupidity and nonsense? Who are you trying to impress? Hold on, guys. We got a distraction here. Who are you trying to impress with your nonsense? 
Sorry, guys. Satan has to bring in people to distract us. Dr. Chester, I'm talking to you because you're about to be sent on your merry way for making a very stupid comment as if you're impressing us because you're intelligent. As if we thought the word J was in Hebrew and in Greek because we were so stupid. We thought J is a letter of the Hebrew alphabet or the Greek. See, that's how stupid we are. Okay. Send him on his merry way because now the coward won't say anything. Do not come back to my channel and pontificate. You don't impress anyone. Get him out of here, guys. Block him. Let's start over again by the grace of Jesus Christ. Okay. Psalm 102, verse 1, verse 12, verses 18 to 22 and 24 to 27. That's what happens when you want to wax eloquent and pretend you know what you're talking about. <clears throat> Woo! That killed me. Okay, read, guys. Pay attention. Oh, Jehovah, hear my prayer. Let my cry for help reach you. But you remain forever, O oh Jehovah, and your fame will endure for all generations. So it's about Jehovah, right? <clears throat> read. It's about Jehovah, not a creature. This is written for the future generation so that a people yet to be brought forth will praise Jah. For he looks down from his holy height from the heavens. Jehovah views the earth to hear the sighting of the prisoner to release those sentenced to death so that the name of Jehovah will be declared in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. When the peoples and kingdoms gather together to serve Jehovah. You see, it's about Jehovah. It's not about someone else. Now let's read 24. To 27. Thank you, guys. Super chat. God bless you. I said, Oh my God, do not do away with me in the middle of my life. You whose years span all generations. Long ago, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you'll remain. Just like a garment, they will all wear out. Just like clothing, you will replace them, and they will pass away. Did you catch what Hebrews 1 10 to 12 just did? Hebrews 1, 10 to 12, took a psalm where Jehovah's being praised and glorified for being the unchanging creator, sustainer of all creation. Jehovah, the psalmist God, he's the one who laid the foundation of the earth and made the heavens with his hands at the beginning. And that psalm about Jehovah being the unchangeable creator and sustainer of all creation is now ascribed to the Son by the Father, so the Father now identifies the Son as that Jehovah of Psalm 102, the God of the psalmist, who is Jehovah Almighty, the unchanging creator and sustainer of all creation. Guys, thank you for the super chats. God bless you. You understand what Hebrews 1, 10 to 12 just did? It's okay, Sharon. I'm live streaming now, so I just put you on live so people can hear you. Let me call you back, okay? Sorry about that. Are you with me there? Do you understand what you just read in Hebrews 1, 10 to 12? Hebrews 1, 10 to 12 took Psalm 102, where Jehovah is identified as the psalmist God, and where the psalmist glorifies Jehovah. As the one who at the beginning laid the foundations of the, the earth and the heavens are the work of Jehovah's hands, they will wear out. And like a robe, Jehovah will roll them up. They will change. But Jehovah's years never end and he remains the same. And that psalm about Jehovah glorifying him for being the eternal, unchangeable creator and sustainer of all creation is now applied to the Son by the Father. So the Father now identifies Jesus as that Jehovah Almighty, the unchangeable creator, sustainer of all creation. Thank you, Sydney. God bless you. Do you understand what you just read from Hebrews 1? Before I move on. I can't move on until you get it. And I repeat myself more than once because if you don't get it, you can't use it. If you get it and understand it, you can use it to silence the lies and the blasphemies and glorify Jesus. Okay, now here's what's astonishing. Okay, here's what's astonishing. In Hebrews 1, 10 to 12, 
It's God the Father praising and glorifying Jesus as Jehovah God Almighty of Psalm 102, the unchangeable eternal creator and sustainer of all creation. But hold on. That means Jesus is not God the Father. Because God the Father is speaking to the Son about the Son. That means the Son is not God the Father. Jesus the Son is not God the Father. Thank you, Sister Lindsay. The Father and Son are two distinct persons. But hold on. God the Father is Jehovah. God the Father is Jehovah. But then how can Jehovah say to Jesus, you are Jehovah, the eternal, unchangeable creator and sustainer of all things, when the Son is not the Father, and yet the Father is Jehovah, and Jehovah is only one? Let it sink in. God bless you for the super chats, guys. Lord bless you tremendously. You understand what you just read in Hebrews 1? God the Father is Jehovah. He couldn't be God if he isn't. He's speaking to the Son, so the Son is not the Father. Let's unpack this. I'm going to go very slow. Thank you, Zivko. I'm going to go very slow and unpack it. Because if you get this argument, you decimate Joe's witnesses. You decimate the Aryan Unitarian heretics. It's over for them. You expose them for being the blasphemous tools of the devil that they are until they repent. And you see why the early church adopted the doctrine of the Trinity. Okay, so let's do this. God the Father we know is Jehovah. He speaks to the Son and identifies the Son as Jehovah God of Psalm 102. The God of Psalm 102 who is eternal, unchangeable, who created and sustains all creation. So the Father just prays and glorified the Son as being Jehovah as well. Hold on. Father is not the Son. The Father is Jehovah. And Jesus is Jehovah, but Jehovah is only one. Welcome to the wonderful world of the Trinity. Thank you, Rias. God bless you. Jehovah is only one. Welcome to the wonderful world of the Trinity. And if you don't get what Hebrews 1 is saying, at the beginning, Jesus laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of his hands. You know what that's referring to? At the beginning? That is echoing Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You understand what Hebrews is trying to show you? Hebrews is trying to show you that when you read Genesis 1 and it says, In the beginning, expect to find Jesus there because Jesus is the one who at the beginning in Genesis created the heavens and the earth. So wait, Hebrews, you're a Jew and you know the Old Testament. Yes. Genesis 1, God created the heavens and the earth. Yes. And the Spirit of God was there with him. Yes. Genesis 1, 2, the Spirit of God. But now you're telling me that Jesus was there at the beginning and he's the one who created the heavens and the earth. The heavens are the work of his hands. And he laid the foundations of the earth? Yes. So you're saying that Jesus is the God who was there with the Spirit to create all things? Yes. But wasn't the Father there too? Of course. Oh, so the God of Genesis 1 who was there with his Spirit creating all things is the Father and the Son. You understand what you just read? The God of Genesis 1 is the Father and the Son. And the Spirit is the Spirit of the Father and the Son. Let me unpack it for you. Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2. Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2. Pay attention, guys. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and desolate, and there was darkness upon the surface of the watery deep. And this is where we needed to abandon Joe's witness translation. Notice the mistranslation. And God's active force was moving about over the surface of the waters. Okay? Now they deliberately mistranslated Ruach Elohim. The Hebrew in Genesis 1-2 says Ruach Elohim. Post the King James. Genesis 1-2 of the King James. Let me prove it to you. I 
Let me unpack Genesis 1, 1 through light of the New Testament. Here you go. Hey, guys, here you go. Here's the link. Can you guys click on the link and see that the Hebrew says, Ruach Elohim, Ruach Elohim. Let's read the King James. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Guys, can you click on that link? And see, it says, Ruach Elohim. And if you see what Ruach means, it means spirit. Elohim is the word for God. Okay? Ruach Elohim. Okay, now, Ruach Elohim means the spirit of God. So now, if I interpret Genesis in light of the New Testament, here's what you learn. Pay attention. At the beginning, the Father says it was the Son, Jesus, at the beginning, who laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of his hands. At the beginning is echoing Genesis 1. So here's what you're supposed to learn. Make sure you get it. In Genesis 1, the Elohim there, when it says in the beginning, God created, the word is Elohim. The Elohim there is the Father and the Son together. So that in verse 2, when it says Ruach Elohim, Ruach Elohim is spirit of God. But in light of the New Testament, it's the spirit of the Father and the Son. So what the New Testament is telling you is the Elohim in Genesis 1 is the Father and the Son who together by their spirit created all things. So the Ruach Elohim is the spirit of the Father and the Son. You getting it or no? Okay. So the New Testament is saying the Spirit of God is the Spirit of the Father and the Son. The Spirit of God is the Spirit of the Father and the Son. Yeah, but it doesn't always mean plural in the sense of more than one person. But I want you to get it. In other words, in light of the New Testament, Elohim doesn't mean the Trinity. Guys, please pay attention and make sure you're getting this. The New Testament is telling you the Elohim of Genesis 1 is not the Trinity. The Elohim of Genesis 1 is the Father and the Son. Because in verse 2, the Spirit belongs to Elohim. Ruach Elohim, Spirit of Elohim. So here you have the Spirit and you have Elohim. The Spirit belongs to the Elohim and is inseparable from Elohim. So according to the New Testament, the Elohim is the Father and the Son, and the Spirit belongs to them both. Joseph, let me change subject. Let me abandon what I'm talking about to help you understand how we know the Spirit is not simply a breath but a person because you haven't gone on my YouTube channel and searched the sessions I did Proving the Spirit is a person from the Old and New Testament. Let me abandon with the topic to appease you because you're that important and no one else matters, Joseph. Okay, Joseph? How long do you think you're going to last here, Joseph? Okay. Are you with me there? I don't think Isaac's going to last long either. Because he's on a rant about his daddy. He's got daddy issues. Instead of focusing on learning this material and trust the Holy Spirit to convict his father to repent, he's about daddy, daddy. Uh, Isaac, I'm going to put a song for you. It's by one of the greatest singers that ever lived, right? Austin Powers. Daddy, daddy wasn't there. Okay, now focus. Okay, focus here. Don't let... Satan used you to distract, okay? Even better, I'll, I'll change the song. Granny, granny wasn't there, okay? Now focus. If we let the New Testament interpret Genesis 1, when it says, in the beginning, Elohim, Elohim is not the Trinity. Elohim is the Father and the Son. Okay, get Isaac out of here. Isaac, don't come back to my channel. You need to go. Go find someone else. Please get him out of here. I don't need these distractions. Elohim is the father and the son. 
So when it says Ruach Elohim, let's get this point. Ruach Elohim, it means the Spirit of God. But in light of the New Testament, he's the Spirit of the Father and the Son. So Elohim is the Father and the Son. Ruach Elohim is the Spirit of the Father and the Son in light of the New Testament. Are you with me there? If I believe the New Testament correctly interprets the Old Testament, then in light of Hebrews, in light of John, John 1, in light of Colossians 1, the Elohim of Genesis 1 is the Father and the Son, and the Ruach, the Spirit, is the Spirit of the Father and the Son. So from the New Testament, Elohim is not the Trinity here. Elohim in Genesis 1 is the Father and the Son, and the Ruach is the Spirit of the Father and the Son, who are the Elohim. Did you get it? Everyone got it before I move on to the next point? Is someone confused? Let me know. I don't, I don't mind if you're confused because I want to help you. Now, let me show you where the New Testament shows the Spirit of God is the Spirit of the Father and the Son. Are you ready for that? The Spirit of God is the Spirit of the Father and the Son. There is no difference, Karas. Spirit of Elohim is the Holy Spirit. They're one and the same. There is no difference. Can I show you that? That the Spirit of God is the Spirit of the Father and the Son. Hold on. Sorry about that. Okay, let me show you. You ready? Are you ready for the proof? Romans 8, verse 9. Romans 8, verse 9. Romans 8, verse 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Did you guys catch it? Romans 8, 9 says, the spirit of God is the spirit of Christ. So if you have the spirit, you have the spirit of God living in you. And if you have the Spirit of God, that means you have the Spirit of Christ. And if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you don't have the Spirit of God, you don't have the Spirit in you. Now put in the Jehovah's Witness Bible, Romans 8 verse 9 in the Jehovah's Witness Bible. Uh, excuse me. However, you are in harmony, not with the flesh, but with the Spirit, if God's Spirit truly dwells in you. This is the Jehovah's Witness Bible. But if anyone does not have Christ's spirit, this person does not belong to him. So did you catch it? The spirit of God is the spirit of Christ. If you have the spirit, that means the spirit of God is living in you, which means you have the spirit of Christ. But if you don't have the spirit of Christ, you don't have the spirit of God living in you, you don't have the spirit. Let it sink in before I move on to the next point. Did it sink in? Okay, let's read Romans 8, 14 to 17. Romans 8, 14 to 17. So I want to make sure you're getting it. Romans 8, 14 to 17. Jehovah's Witness Bible. For all who are led by God's Spirit. Notice whose Spirit? God's Spirit. Guys, pay attention. If you're led by God's Spirit, you are indeed God's sons. If you're led by God's Spirit, Spirit, Okay, you are indeed God's sons, sons and daughters. Romans 8, 14. It's the Jehovah's Witness Bible. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery causing fear again, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons, by which spirit we cry out, Abba, Father. Notice, the spirit of God, God's spirit, moves us to cry out, Abba, Father. Whose spirit causes me to realize I'm a son of God and I have the right to call God, Abba, Father? God's spirit. God's spirit bears witness with my spirit that I'm a son of God and I can call God Abba Father, okay? The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are God's children. Verse 17, if then we are children, we are also heirs, heirs indeed of God, but joint heirs with Christ, provided we suffer together so that we may also be glorified together. So God's Spirit, the Spirit of God, bears witness with my spirit. I'm a son of God and I can call him Abba Father. But now let's go to Galatians 4, verses 4 to 6, specifically verse 6. Galatians 4, verses 4 to 6, specifically verse 6. Jehovah's Witness Bible. 
You can't use it in every, every place because they pervert a lot of passages. Now here, Galatians 4, verses 4 to 6. But when the full limit of the time arrived, God sent his son, who was born of a woman who was under the law, that he might release by purchase those under law so that we might receive the adoption as sons. Now because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son, the spirit of his son into our hearts, and it cries out, Abba, Father. Okay, now, guys, I'm confused. In Romans 8, 14 and 16, specifically Romans 8, 14 and 15, it says it's the spirit of God, God's spirit, that makes me cry out, Abba, Father. But here in Galatians 4, verse 6, it says it's the spirit of the son, Jesus, the spirit of Jesus, the son, that makes me cry out, Abba, Father. And it's the same writer, Paul. Paul wrote Romans and he wrote Galatians. Help me understand how that works. So are you seeing the Spirit of God the Father is the Spirit of Jesus Christ the Son? The Holy Spirit belongs to God the Father and to Jesus Christ the Son. Do you see it? The Holy Spirit belongs to the Father and the Son. So this means if you let the New Testament interpret Genesis 1, here's the conclusion. When Genesis 1 verses 1 and 2 says, In the beginning Elohim created the heavens and the earth, and then it says the spirit of Elohim was, was there. According to New Testament, that Elohim is father and son. So it's saying in the beginning, the father and son created the heavens and the earth. And the spirit of the father and son was there. So you have a New Testament basis to prove Elohim refers to two persons, the father and the son. So Elohim refers to the two persons of the Godhead, Father and Son, not the Trinity. You understand what I'm saying? The New Testament is telling you Elohim is Father and Son, but you can't say it's a Trinity. And the Spirit belongs to Elohim. The Spirit is inseparable from Elohim. The Spirit belongs to Father and Son who are Elohim. Is it making sense? Before I move on, before I move on, if you're not not getting it, uh, zero one, what does dualism got to do with pointing to the Trinity? I'm showing that exegetically Elohim is father and son. That doesn't mean God is not a Trinity. It means not every passage is going to prove the Trinity. What you prove from Genesis 1 in light of the New Testament is Elohim is Father and Son, and the Spirit is there, inseparable from the Father and Son, right? One with the Father and Son, and was there before creation. Not every passage is going to prove the Trinity. You understand? Marcus. My brother, do you see what the title is today? Hebrews testifies that Jesus, Jehovah, God Almighty. Do you want me to abandon my topic so I can help you learn what the Trinity is and the best proofs for the Trinities are? Trinity are, as the Holy Spirit loosens my tongue? Because it's about you. We're not important. My topic's not important. Marcus, you're important. We exist for you, and we exist for, what was his name, John? Everyone with me? Everyone got it? Oh, Joseph. We exist for Joseph and you, Marcus. No, Joseph, I can't. Just go on my YouTube channel, search Holy Spirit, and it's going to pop up. That's it. Or Marco, I'm sorry. I don't mean in self, Marcus. Marco, which part of the title Hebrew testifies that Jesus, Jehovah, God Almighty wasn't clear? Because, again, I don't understand. You're Christians. Control yourself. May the Holy Spirit give me the grace to control myself because I need a lot more self-control. Folks, control yourself. We got a topic. Don't diverge from the topic. And realize I have a YouTube channel. I've been doing this for two years. Believe me, I have a lot of sessions on the Trinity and the Holy Spirit. And I have articles on my blog and my website, answeringislam.net. Don't be lazy. Go and search, brethren. Okay. Sorry, I got to be harsh with you guys. But come on now. Yeah, have so, have so. I have a way of calming myself down. You know, the Buddhists, they, they say, um, which is heretical and blasphemous. So I have another way of doing it. 
Logo. Logo. All right. So if everyone got those two points, I'm ready to move on to the third point. Luisa, everyone else, you got that point? What did we establish from Hebrews 1, 10 to 12? What did we establish from Hebrews 1, 10 to 12? We established that the Father takes Psalm 102, a psalm that glorifies Jehovah as the unchangeable, eternal creator and sustainer of all things. And the Father says, that is about you, my son. The psalmist, when he glorifies Jehovah, that's you. He's glorifying you because you were there at the beginning, Genesis 1. You were there who created the heavens and the earth. But I was there with you. And so was our spirit. Our spirit was with us. You and I, Father and Son, the Elohim of Genesis 1, and our spirit was with us. So could, do you, could you find any more clearer proof that the New Testament, especially Hebrews, says... Jesus is Jehovah God Almighty, eternal, uncreated, created, the creator of all things. I mean, could Hebrews 1 be any clearer? Jesus is not the Father. He's the Father's Son. And the Father created through the Son. So the Father and the Son together created. The Son didn't create alone. And so the Father acknowledges the role of the Son in creating and glorifies the son in his role of creating, saying, you, my son, you were there at the beginning with me. And with me, you laid the foundations of the earth. And with me, the heavens are the work of your hands. Together we did it, my son. And like me, you remain the same and your years never end. Unlike creation, which you roll up with me, we roll it up together because the son is not independent of the father. So Hebrews 1 has the father glorifying the son for being the creator and sustainer of all things. Like in other passages, we have the Son glorifying the Father for being the creator and sustainer of all things. Yeah, I know John Doe, Goose Fraba, because you watched Anger Management. Goose Fraba. Everyone got it? Okay, help me, Luisa, to help you. Why are you stuck? What are you stuck about when I say Elohim and the Holy Spirit? Help me to help you, Louisa. See, it was, I was up to 20, David, and you came, and I, I dropped. You understand not every passage, Louisa, is going to be a proof text for the Trinity, right? And not every occurrence of the word God refers to the Trinity. So in Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2, the Elohim there is not the Trinity, it's the Father and the Son. But the Spirit was there because he's the Spirit of Elohim, right, Luisa? He's the Spirit of Elohim, right? I just want to make sure Luisa's getting it. You with me there? I want to make sure she got it. So if the Spirit was there and he's the Spirit of Elohim, and the spirit was there before creation. And he was there when creation came into being. And he was there giving life to creation. Louisa, doesn't this prove that the spirit is not part of creation? Because he was there at the start of creation. And he was there with God, being used by God to create and give life. That's what Genesis 1-2 shows. Are you getting it, Luisa, or no? Because the okay doesn't tell me if you're getting it. Okay. So now, Luisa, help me understand. If the Spirit of God was there at the start of creation, and the Spirit of God was there being used by God to give life to the earth, doesn't this mean that the Spirit, too, is creator? And doesn't this mean that the spirit, too, is separate from creation if he was already there when creation began? That's okay, Luisa. And you can help her answer that. 
If God and His Spirit are there when creation began, and God and His Spirit creates and gives life, that means God and His Spirit are separate from creation and therefore uncreated, and God and His Spirit are the Creator. Right? And now let me prove to you that the Spirit of God was there with God at the start of creation. That means he's separate from creation. And God used that Spirit to give life, showing the Spirit is not a creature, but the creator and life giver and one with Elohim. Yeah, I don't know what part you misunderstood, but everyone there? Can I now prove that to you? Let me prove, let me repeat again what Genesis 1 verses 1 and 2 is showing. The Spirit was there with Elohim, Spirit of Elohim, at the start of creation. And the Spirit was used by Elohim to give life, which means the Spirit is separate from creation and therefore uncreated. And since he gives life, he's the creator and life giver. So you just proved that the Spirit with Elohim is the creator and life giver and therefore God. Right? Now let me give you a text that says that. Job 33, verse 4. Job 33, verse 4. So we can focus on Jesus. That's why Luisa and everyone else, I'm going to repeat it again. I have several sessions in my YouTube channel on the Spirit of God being God Almighty, Jehovah Almighty, Creator and Life Giver, and a person. I already covered this. Now here, Job 33, verse 4. Pay attention, everyone. The Job Witness Bible. Here's what I just said, articulated in Job 33, verse 4. God's own spirit made me, and the Almighty's own breath brought me to life. Wait, wait. Who made you, Job? Who made you, man? God's spirit made me. But Genesis 1 says, Elohim made, made man. Oh, but yeah, but the spirit was there too. Ah, oh, Elohim with a spirit made man. There goes Job 33, verse 4. God's own spirit made me, and the Almighty's own breath brought me to life. And to answer the question, God is not a physical being, so he doesn't literally have breath. What does it mean for the spirit to be God's breath? God is not a physical being. He doesn't literally have physical breath. Breath is a metaphor. Listen to me. Breath is a metaphor used of the spirit to show that he's the life giver. Because why? When you think breath, you think life. Because if you can't breathe, you can't live. So when we call the spirit God's breath, that's not to depersonalize him. God is not a physical being. He doesn't have physical breath. Breath is a metaphor to show you that it's the spirit that gives life to creation. So when God breathes, that's simply a metaphorical way of saying God sent the spirit to give life and breath to creation. That's it. Exactly, Jake. So I understand how Genesis 1 verses 1 and 2, in light of the New Testament, is Trinitarian in that Elohim is the Father, Son, and the Spirit is there with them. Father, Son, Elohim with their Spirit. And their spirit was there with them at the start of creation, meaning their spirit is not part of creation, but separate from creation. But the word Elohim doesn't mean Trinity. In light of the New Testament, the word Elohim in Genesis 1 means father and son. But that the Trinity was there, verse 2 of Genesis 1, and Ruach Elohim, the spirit of Elohim was there. So he was there with Elohim. You want me there? Everyone got it before I move on to the next point? No, Brad Nelson. I think I was talking to a wall. Hold on. Uh, excuse me, wall. Brad Nelson didn't understand this. Uh, wall, Elohim in Genesis 1 is the father and the son. My friend Brad just said, Jesus, Jehovah, was there creating under the supervision of God the Father, Elohim. In other words, he just made Elohim separate from the Son. When I just spent 20 minutes saying 
that the son and the father together are the Elohim of Genesis 1. Now, maybe I wasn't clear, but do you get it? Oh, you got it? You got my point? Wow, thank you. Pins and needles, needles and pins. Uh, it's a happy man that grins. What am I mad about? Okay. Okay. Is it clear now? See, the wall got it, Brad. The wall right here. I'll call him, you know, Tony T. He, this wall is Tony T. This guy is Jimmy John. Jimmy John and Tony T. Tony T, homie from Wyoming, kicking it to my lady Naomi. Yo, me. You got it? What's up, home slice? You too, Jimmy? All right, Jimmy. Okay, everyone with me there? Okay. If you're with me and we all got it, if you're with me and you all got it, man, you got to joke, honestly. If you don't joke, you're going to get stressed out. You're going to lose your mind. You're going to go angry because either I'm failing to communicate because I'm dumb or people are not listening because they want to say something and impose their understanding on what you're saying. Thank you, Satu. Yeah, I am. And pretty soon there, I'm going to be talking to Walls in Bellevue. I'm going to be in a straight jacket. Hey, Tony T, you're with me. You didn't leave me, friend. Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy, you're here. Oh, Jimmy, thank you. Hey, what's up, Lucille? You're still. All right. Okay, everyone got it? Yeah, yeah, guys, do subscribe. He's right. He said, you guys, you guys really love me? You got to subscribe. I need all the subscribes I can get. Yeah. Okay. Now, if you guys got it, we can move on to the other point. Now, Lisa, I want to make sure you got my point. That the Elohim doesn't mean the Trinity. Elohim means the Father and Son. But that the spirit is eternal, uncreated, that's clear from Genesis 1, verses 1 to 2, because it says the spirit of Elohim is there with Elohim, which New Testament says is the Father and Son. So the spirit is there with Elohim, and he's there before creation, so he's uncreated. And the Elohim, Father and Son, use the spirit to give life. And folks, please do me a favor. Go back. To my YouTube channel, search for the Spirit. I promise you, I have sessions proving the Holy Spirit is God Almighty, Creator, Jehovah, a person from the Old and New Testaments. God bless you, David Julius, and watch over you. I have gone mad. Okay, if that's clear, can we move to the third point? Because now I'm going to show you what that Jehovah Witness heretic tried to do with Hebrews 1. And show you how to refute them. Because now I want to go into the meat of the matter. You're scaring me, Luisa, because I don't know how I said it. That would confuse you. I thought I was clear. Now I'm getting scared that I'm not clear as I think. Exactly, Anna Groin. Now I can understand why Solomon heard ants. Because dealing with human beings, Anna Groin, will drive you to the point you're going to start hearing walls and chairs and ants speaking. Because you have better conversations with walls and chairs and ants than you do with humans because they get you. They get you. They understand. Do you understand me? You do? I got to kiss you. Not in front of the public, though. All right. Okay. Now let's go to the other point, folks. Are we ready now? To the other point. Okay. Here is the point. Was it clear that in Hebrews 1, 10 to 12, the Father glorified Jesus as Jehovah God Almighty of Psalm 1, 2? That the Father says, you, my son, are the Jehovah of Psalm 102, the Jehovah who at the beginning laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands that roll up creation like a garment. But you remain the same and your years never end. So you are that Jehovah God of Psalm 102 who is set to be the unchangeable, eternal creator and sustainer of all things. Clear? The Father just praised the Son as Jehovah God Almighty, the creator and sustainer of all things. Clear? And we use the Jehovah Witness Bible. Right? 
to prove our point. Now, what's the objection? Now, let's talk about the objection because I'll be done with this series with this session. If you remember the discussion I had last week with that EEW Jehovah Witness heretic, you remember when I told him to read Psalm 102, he didn't read it in the Revised Standard Version. He didn't read it in the Jehovah Witness Bible, though he's a Jehovah Witness. He ran to the Septuagint. Do you remember that? And I called him out for it because now I'm going to teach you, especially you Greek Orthodox that believe the Septuagint, I'm going to show you how they misuse the Septuagint to deny that Jesus is Jehovah. Are you ready? This is what I was preparing you for. All of this was to prepare you for this objection. Yeah, Bible ping pong. If you don't remember, go back. It was Monday where I talked about Jesus being the eternal word. And he called in. And when I said read Psalm 102, he ran to the Septuagint. Now, folks, I need you to listen because I want you to know and learn your faith with greater depth by the power of the Holy Spirit and live it out, all of us, for the glory of Jesus. Okay. The Septuagint is the term given for the Greek versions of the Old Testament. Tradition says about 280 years before the birth of our Lord, a group of Jewish scholars, the tradition is about 70, some say 72, translated the first five books of Moses into Greek. That Greek translation became known as the Septuagint. Let me spell it. Guys, really, you got to learn this. And I promise you, when you start speaking this way, you're going to have people in seminary amazed. They're going to know, how do you know this stuff? Did you go to college? No. Did you go to seminary? No. Where did you get this stuff? The Holy Spirit gave it to us free of charge by raising up men and women of Christ to teach us online for free. The Holy Spirit did. Okay, Septuagint. The reason why it's called Septuagint, because this is a transliteration of a Latin word. The Latin word is about 280 years. Septuaginta. Septuaginta. Septuaginta is a Latin word for 70. 70. The translation of the 70. That's why if you guys really pay attention to your Bibles that has notes, you'll see in the notes, sometimes they'll refer to LXX. The Roman numerals for 70. Or sometimes you'll see this in your notes telling you that this reading comes from the Greek versions of the Old Testament. So the Septuagint is the Latin is the English transliteration of Septuaginta. Septuaginta means 70, because tradition says that the first five books of Moses were translated by 70 scribes into Greek. Now you have Greek Orthodox here and you have Orthodox here. How many Orthodox Christians here from the Orthodox Church? Raise your hand or put a one or say I or say yes. Watch here. Hey, Panus Filippo, I love your name, man. Panus Filippo. Filippo. Anna growing and Panus. Okay. They are from the Greek Orthodox Church. Anyone else? Karas, you're from there too? Oi, oi. How many? They're going to confirm this so you know I'm not making it up. Okay, you're Coptic. Okay, close enough. Not, no, okay. All right. So far, we only have two. Now, why is that important? They will tell you that the Greek Orthodox Church does not follow the Hebrew version of the Old Testament. The Greek Orthodox Church rejects the Hebrew version for the Greek version because... They'll tell you that when the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, because the New Testament is written in Greek, they quote the Greek version, the Septuagint. And this is why the Greek Orthodox Church only follows the Greek versions called the Septuagint, and they do not follow the Hebrew version. Am I lying, Greek Orthodox? Am I lying? Because Pedro is saying, oh, really? I know you believe me, but anyway. I want to let the Greek Orthodox confirm if they haven't left us. Yes. What does the Greek Orthodox Church follow, Anna? See, Panos said true. You see? And the Greek Orthodox Church has produced an official English translation of the Bible called the Orthodox Study Bible. 
Now, the Old Testament of the Orthodox Study Bible is a fresh English translation of the Greek versions, not of the Hebrew. The Orthodox Study Bible, the English translation of the Old Testament, is based entirely on the Greek versions, not on the Hebrew. Listen. Don't attack. Stop and listen. Are you with me there? But you know what they use for the English New Testament? Do you know what they use for the English New Testament in the Orthodox Study Bible? They didn't make a translation yet that I'm aware of. They go with the New King James Version. So in the Orthodox Study Bible, their New Testament is the New King James Version. Their Old Testament is a fresh English translation based on the Greek versions, not the Hebrew. So did everyone get that point? So I can show you the importance. Everyone got that point? Okay. Thank God for modern technology because we have an English translation of the Greek versions of the Old Testament online for free. Here's the link. Go here, click on the link, because this is what that heretic did. Don't ask me yet. I'll, I'll, I'll answer why in the New King James Version later. That link, yeah, I'll have you post in a minute. I want you to click on that link. There it goes. Click on that link. Here's an English translation of the Greek versions of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. Are you with me there? This is what that Jehovah Witness heretic was using. Why did he go to the English translation of Psalm 102, of the Greek, the Greek version of Psalm 102? Are you not, you're ready for the argument? Because all this is trying to help you understand what the objection is. The link works perfectly. Either copy and paste or, or click on it. It's working. What do you mean here? I click on it. Why is it? Yeah, it works, guys. Put down the pipe, children. It works. You either click on it or copy and paste. Oh, you little sinners. It works. The second link is the first link. Okay, now, here's what these anti-Trinitarians try to do. Okay, if you're not listening, you won't get the point. Dibs, are you saying you're human? What proof do you have that you're human and not a filthy, rabid dog born from your mother in a doghouse, Dimps? Get this dog out of here. The second link is the same link, brother. Riaz, instead of chiming in, why don't you get rid of Dimps? You're not a mod for nothing. Little sinner. Okay, now, watch me now. Pay attention. In my discussion with that Jehovah Witness heretic, in that in my discussion with that Jehovah Witness heretic, he quoted the Greek version, the English translation of the Greek version. Do you know why? Do you know why? Do you know why he quoted it? Does anyone have an idea why he quoted it? Focus, guys. Don't let the devil distract you. Because this doesn't have to be longer than necessary. Send Draper to his dog, mother, to the doghouse that he came out of. Don't insult Doberman. You're more filthy than them. Because for some reason, these heretics think that Psalm 102, 25, 27, in the Greek version, is not talking about Jehovah. But it's Jehovah talking about someone else, the Messiah. So they think it's been buffered in a while, and it buffered right now. See? I haven't buffered in a while. I buffered. Lord Jesus rebuked these distractions of the devil. Okay. They'll tell you that the Greek version is different from the Hebrew. Because in the Greek version, it's God speaking of someone that's not God, namely the Messiah. NBP, Ezekiel 23, it's not about your mother. All right? Are you with me there? You understand why he went to it? They believe that the Greek version changes the speakers 
so that it's God now speaking of the Messiah, not the psalmist speaking about Jehovah. If you didn't get the argument, I can't show you how to refute them. Okay? The reason why that heretic went to Psalm 101 is because these heretics think the Greek version, there's a change in the speakers. So it's not the psalmist talking about Jehovah. It's now Jehovah talking about someone else. That someone else being the Messiah, a creature that he used to create. You see what he's trying to do? If you understand what he's trying to do, I cannot show you how that is a lie from the pit of hell that the Greek version doesn't change the speakers in midstream. The Greek version doesn't have Jehovah speaking about someone else. It's still the psalmist talking about Jehovah. I want to show you how to destroy the shameless butchering of Psalm 101. Are you with me in here? Are you not ready for the evidence? Okay. Do me a favor, First Lance, if you can quote. Quote Psalm 101, because in the Greek version, it's Psalm 101, verses 23, 27, if you can. If not, I'll do it. Can you do it? Psalm 101, 23, 27. Pay attention, guys. Yes. He was doing it deliberately to fit his beliefs because he is deceived. It's both. Exactly, Jake, they would. Watch here now. Watch what he was trying to do, why I called him a wicked dog. Now you see why I was calling him a wicked dog? Okay, now notice. He answered him in the way of his strength. Tell me the fewness of my day. See, do they say here? See, that's God speaking. God is now speaking. He answered him in the way of his strength. Tell me the fewness, fewness of my days, but thou art the same. Okay. Why do I have such mods? I don't pay them anything, but first, last, are you like tired today? Or maybe you haven't had a lot and left sleep. So forget 24, 25, 26, first, last. Forget it. Let's go from 23, 27, because you're a genius. And I thought Protestant believer is bad. Okay, first last, let's try this again. Psalm 102, 23 to 27. One more time. I'll give it to you in a minute. Okay, let's read, guys. First last is posting. He answered him in the way of his strength. He answered him in the way of his strength. Tell me the fewness of my days. Take me not away in the midst of my days. Thy years are through all generations. In the beginning, thou, O Lord, didst lay the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as a garment and as a vesture. Shalt thou fold them, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and the years shall not fail. So they're going to tell you that the speaker changes in 23, where the speaker says, see, God answered me. God answered me. Right? In the way of his strength. And then God starts speaking in verse 24 all the way to 27. You understand what they're saying? That when he says, he answered me, he answered me. God answered me, right? In the way of his strength. From that moment, God is speaking. So God is saying, tell me the fewness of my days. Now, some will say, no. That's not God speaking there. He starts speaking in 24. But let's go with 24. According to them, God is now saying in 24, Take me not away in the midst of my days. Thy years are through all generations. In the beginning, thou Lord, God is saying, Take me not away in the midst of my days. Thy years are through all generations. That's God speaking. You see in their hatred of the Trinity... And their hatred of Jesus, they're going to have 
the speaker change. God speaks, but then God says, take me not away, right? In the midst of my days. God speaks like that. God says, don't take me away in the midst of my days. Guys, look at it again. Psalm 102, 23 to 25. It's Psalm 101 in the Greek. But even 25, <clears throat> there is no indication the speakers change. He answered him the way of his strength. Tell me the fewness of my days. Take me not away in the midst of my days. Thy ears are through all generations. In the beginning, thou, O Lord. Where does the speaker change? Where does it change from the speaker speaking to God speaking? Now, if you want to say 25, where does it show the speaker changes in 25? Exactly Proverbs 24, 11. But now let's say Proverbs 24, 11 says, no, it's in 25. That's when God speaks. Where do you see a change in the speaker? Where does it say 25? Now God is speaking. That's what he was trying to convince us. He was trying to convince us that somewhere there, God is speaking. But he knows he can't say God starts speaking at the last part of 23 or at the beginning of 24. Right? So he may say, well, now God is speaking in 25. Where does the speaker change? Now, let me give you further proof. The speaker doesn't change. It's a psalmist saying, God answered me. When I was in need, I cried out and he answered me. And then the psalmist breaks out in praise. It's not the psalmist saying, God answered me. And here's what he said. It's God heard my prayers and he didn't take me away in, in the midst of my strength. He didn't take me away when my days were short. And then the and he's, it's the speaker talking about God preserving his life. And then he breaks out in praise of God. There is no change in speaker. But you see how much they hate the true Jesus and the Trinity that they would stoop to that level and pervert this the Greek version of Psalm 102 to make it say something it doesn't say, to rob Jesus of his glory, Jehovah. You see how satanic and wicked this is and why? I was harsh with that filthy, blasphemous dog and had no mercy for him. You see why I was angry with him? Now, let me show you. There is no change in the speaker. It's the same speaker speaking of Jehovah. Yeah, guys ready? We're going to use the Greek version. Okay. Same speaker speaking of Jehovah. Now let's, again, we're going to use the Greek version. Psalm 101, which in the Greek version is Psalm 101, but his is Psalm 102, verses 18 to 27. Pay attention. Psalm 101, verse 18 to 27. Psalm 102 in your Bibles that are not rendered from the Greek. Okay, now read, guys. Tell me who the Lord is. Let this be written for another generation, and the people that shall be created shall praise the Lord. Pay attention to the word Lord. For he has looked out from the height of the sanctuary. The Lord looked upon the earth from heaven to hear the groaning of the fettered ones, to loosen the sons of the slain, to proclaim the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. When the people are gathered together and the kings to serve the Lord. Notice, Lord, Lord, Lord. Okay, pay attention. He answered him. The Lord answered him in the way of his strength. Tell me the fewness of my days. Lord, remind me how few my days are. Take me not away in the midst of my days, but preserve my life. Thy years are through all generations. In the beginning, thou, O Lord. Wait, wait. All through that context, the Lord was Jehovah. The Lord saw from heaven. Serve the Lord. Praise the Lord. Where does the Lord change in this context? In the beginning, O Lord, didst lay the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as a garment, and as a vesture shall thou fold them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Where does the Lord change? From verses 18 to 27, it's the same Lord, 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 Lord. 
Where do you have the Lord God speaking about another Lord? Where do you have the Lord God then taking over the conversation and speaking of someone else who is the Lord? Can you respect such people that would shamefully pervert the Bible to this extent in order to rob Jesus of his glory and deny the Trinity because they hate the true God and the true Jesus and won't let God be who he is and Jesus who he is? Okay. That's what he was trying to do. That's why I did two sessions now. To refute this lie. Now, guys, please go back to my archive. I have lots of videos over two years where I go in-depth on these issues. The Trinity, Holy Spirit as God and a divine person, Old and New Testaments. Jesus as God appearing in the Old Testament. I have lots of sessions in-depth. Listen to them. Re-listen to them. Make clips out of them. Upload it to your YouTube channels. Spread them. This information is for you, free of charge to use to glorify Christ. Okay? So you understand why I was harsh with him, right? But what did you learn again? Heretics do not follow the Bible. Heretics make the Bible follow them. This is why they won't stay with any one translation. Notice how that son of Satan was using the Revised Standard Version but then he changed the version on me and went to the Greek version. Yeah, the Septuagint is an excellent version of the Old Testament in Greek. And it's been used by Christians for centuries. There's nothing wrong with the Septuagint. The Greek version of the Old Testament, the Latin version of the Old Testament, the Syriac. These are all the languages in which the people of God translated the original languages of the Bible. To reach those people who didn't speak Hebrew, read Hebrew, write Hebrew, or Greek. Is everyone with me there? Do you see how these heretics are not committed to the Bible? Exactly, Pedro. You see where I went with this? See, Pedro, you're smart. God bless you. May he sharpen your intellect and all of our intellect and give us passion to love Jesus and obey him for his glory. You see why I asked him the question, Pedro? What translation are you using? Because I was going to stick to the translation to obliterate him. But you see what he did, right? And you saw how I caught him and I said, why you snake, you demon, you change the translation on me. Right? Yes, Borid Asif. The Dead Sea Scrolls are copies of the Old Testament writings produced 200, 200 years before Christ that were discovered in 1947. Isaiah 48, 16, 17 is not the clearest proof text for the Trinity. I don't have time to show you why, brother, because we're going to be here all day. It proves two divine persons, God and a spirit, but not necessarily three. So do you see why you need to be wise as serpents, innocent as doves, and be aware of the schemes of the devil? Meaning, meaning, know how the enemy thinks, Know what his schemes are. Know how his children operate so that you won't be caught off guard by their deceit and cunning and be ready to decimate them with the truth of the gospel. Not long enough, Paul R. I haven't been walking with the Lord long enough. And I keep telling you that the first five books of the Old Testament were translated about 280 years before Christ, but you keep shortening it to 200. It's your world, Anna. I'm just a squirrel. If you want a 200, that's up to you. Okay, you with me there? You understand where I'm going with this? No, brother, they're not paying me to read their super chats. They're supporting me out of their love for Jesus to support the ministry. And I try to look at what the super chats say, and I say, God bless you all. But I can't keep focus on what is said in every comment or I'll get lost. But thank you for your concern, Gunster. And I hope you don't think by paying me you're going to get my attention. That's an insult to me. You insult me when you think you, you're going to pay me for my attention. Don't do that, brother. That's a shame. You either give out of the love for the Lord for the work or don't give. You're not obligated.
But don't say you're paying me to read the chats. You're insulting me. I'm not a whore for your money. May God save me to never. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, guys. This is man. It's acting up in Jesus' name. I pray in Jesus' name. I never whore myself for money or fame, but I do it for the glory of Christ with integrity. So don't ever insult me and say people are paying you super chats to read their comments. You will not last here. Don't pay me to get my attention. Are you listening, Gunster? Or you're ignoring me. Don't ever pay me to get my attention. If you give, God bless you. We're in ministry, and I appreciate it. But don't use money to get my attention. That's not going to work. It's going to offend me because you're being used of the devil to tempt me to whore myself for money and fame. God forbid, may it never happen. May the Lord keep me holy and pure and do it for his glory, even if it means I starve or I die. And may he have mercy on my children. Okay. Now, for the rest of you, everyone with me, you got it? You understand Bible ping pong here? Bible ping pong? You see why they won't stay with any one translation? Right? And they're going to switch translation because when a translation refutes them, exposes them as children of the devil, they'll abandon it for another translation. So don't let them do that. Don't fall for their snares. Be aware of their schemes and work against it. Now, officially, it's done. I just covered Hebrews 1, and I showed you what the response was, what he was trying to do, and how to decimate it by the power of Jehovah Jesus. Go back, re-listen to these sessions, re-re-listen until it becomes second nature. Use the information. Make it second nature to you. In the power of the Holy Spirit, use it. You can make clips out of these videos. Upload them to your YouTube channels. Use the information for the glory of Christ. With that said, with that said, if you have any questions related to this, any topic, now I'll open up for 10 minutes of Q&A. You can ask me in the text or call me on Skype. You can ask me in the text or call me on Skype. 10 minutes of Q&A and I'm done. And Lord willing, God willing, tomorrow I will try to do a session on John 3, 5, what it means to be born of water and spirit. Pray for me. Yeah, give them the Skype name. Now, guys, Skype has asked me sincere questions not to attack me. Don't call and attack me. You guys are going to send you never, never land. Okay, there's a Skype. First slash just gave it to you. So call me or text me. Really? I am? What patriarchs? Addy. Amen, Ann. Which I didn't know that. Why was Satu timed up, poor brother? He's a solid brother. No. Paul, no. El is not father. Elohim is not father and son. No, brother. That's not what I said. Yeah, it was a good crowd today. We had about 225. No, brother, that's not it. That's not what I said, brother. Don't use that argument. Any questions? Any questions? Call me or text me. So, Paul, let me answer your question more thoroughly. Okay, Paul, are you there, Paul? -er? Oops. Okay, brother, do you want to call me, Diego? Do you want to call or you just want to say, hey, brother, how are you? God bless you, Diego. You have a question, call me. Call me if you have a question. Okay, Paul R. The word L in Hebrew, the word L in Hebrew can refer to the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit. The word Elohim in Hebrew can refer to the Father or the Son or the Holy Spirit, or it can refer to the Father and the Son together. There may be even a place where it refers to the Trinity, but El can be used of the Father. It can be used of the Son. It can be used of the Holy Spirit. Elohim can be used of the Father alone, the Son alone, the Spirit alone, or the Father and Son together like in Genesis 1, right? So don't think because El is singular, it's only the Father. Well, let me see if I can answer, Alex. Go ahead. This is open for anything. Time is winding down. God bless you, Diego. Okay, Andrew. Well, Andrew, I'm very tough and rough, and I maintain a tight ship, and I do mock and attack, 
blasphemers and insult them and their mothers for giving birth to such animals. So if you can handle that, this is for you, and I pray I'll be a blessing to you. Elohim is the name of the true God. So when you say creator God, well, to be the true God is to be the creator, Stephen. Elohim is one of the names of the true God. It's not a unique name or is exclusive name, but Elohim is used in the Bible for the true creator God. But it's not a unique name or an exclusive name. You want me there, Stephen Houston? Any other questions? Yeah, Amos 4.11 is good. Let me give you one passage. Let me give you one passage that does show the plurality within the Godhead if you read carefully, if you are a careful reader. Okay, are you ready? I'm going to give you one. Are you ready? Let's use the Jehovah's Witness Bible. I think that we should read the same way. There is no echad in Genesis 126, Paul R. There is no echad in Genesis 126. Echad is Deuteronomy 6.4 and used in reference to the male and female. It's in Genesis 2.24. Now, let's look at Isaiah 44, verse 6. Isaiah 44, verse 6. Guys, pay attention. Yeah, Timothy. Okay. Read with me. This is what Jehovah says, the king of Israel and his re repurchaser, Jehovah of armies. I'm the first and I'm the last. There is no God but me. Guys, let's reread it one more time. This is what Jehovah says. Who's Jehovah, the king of Israel and his repurchaser, Jehovah of armies. I'm the first and I'm the last. There is no God but me. Now let's look at it in the King James. It's so subtle that you won't catch it if you read over it. Now, the King James of Isaiah 44, verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Post it one more time. Okay. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Now, folks. When it says his redeemer, his repurchaser, who is the his? Thank you, Canadian prospector. God bless you. Who is the his? When it says his redeemer, whose redeemer? Pay attention to the text. Read it. Thus saith the Lord, the king of Israel, and his redeemer, the Lord of hosts. Is it saying Israel's redeemer? Or is it saying Jehovah's redeemer, whose name is Jehovah of hosts? Ironic, right? First and last, you've been asking? No, not Israel. This is where it's subtle and you miss it. It's saying, this is what Jehovah says, the king of Israel and his redeemer. His is referring to Israel's king, not Israel. It's not saying Israel's redeemer. It's saying the redeemer of the king of Israel. You with me there? Pay attention again. Isaiah 44, verse 6. Let's read it. And I'll try to give you an example. Okay. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. It's saying, the King of Israel's Redeemer, Israel, Israel's King's Redeemer, who's the Lord of hosts. And I'll give you an example in English. Thus says, and uh, let me take a pastor maybe. What pastor? Thus says John MacArthur, the pastor of Grace Church and his elder. Let me say it again. Thus says John MacArthur, the pastor of Grace Church and his elder. Who's elder? Where do you get Stephen Anderson, sister? Let me give you an example again. Thus says John MacArthur, the pastor of Grace Church and his elder. Who's elder? Who's the his? The church or John MacArthur? Hafsa, you're still smoking crack. Put down the crack, sister. Go watch some more Halal Hogan videos. Okay. 
How can it be the church's elder when I said his elder? A church is a his? That's a put down the cracks, uh, sister. Okay, let's try it again. Thus says John MacArthur, the pastor of Grace Church and his elder. Last time I checked, a church is not a his. Whose elder? Who's elder, guys? John MacArthur's elder. Likewise, when it says, thus says Jehovah, Israel's king and his redeemer, his means Israel's king's redeemer, because the pronoun doesn't go back to Israel, but to the king of Israel, because it's talking about this king. Which king? Israel's king. And Israel's king has a redeemer who redeems named Jehovah of hosts. Did you catch it? The context is about Israel's king. Israel's king's redeemer. The redeemer of Israel's king. Which king are you talking about, Isaiah? Israel's king. Who's Jehovah? And his redeemer. You got it? So there you have implicit testimony to the fact that Jehovah has a redeemer whom he sends to redeem his people, and that redeemer's name is Jehovah of hosts. You with me there? Who didn't catch that? Because now I'm going to show you who Jehovah's redeemer is. Who Jehovah's redeemer is. I'm going to show it to you in a minute. Okay? Let's look at Isaiah 44, 6 one more time. Isaiah 44, 6, one more time. Let me show it to you. At, Thus saith the Lord, Job, the king of Israel, and his redeemer, the Lord of hosts. So notice his redeemer's name is the Lord of hosts. Did you catch it? You have two are called Jehovah. Jehovah, Israel's king, and Jehovah's redeemer, whose name is Jehovah of hosts. And Jehovah and his redeemer say, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. So Jehovah and his redeemer say, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. That Jehovah has a redeemer whom he sends to redeem? Isaiah 63, 8 to 9. Isaiah 63, 8 to 9. For he said, surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their savior. In all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. And in his love and in his pity, he redeemed them, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. You guys want to look at it in the Jehovah Witness translation? Isaiah 63, 8 to 9, Jehovah Witness translation. Go ahead. Watch here. For he said, surely they are my people, sons who will not be disloyal. So he became their savior. During all their distress, it was distressing to him. And his own personal messenger saved them. His own personal messenger. Man, I like the way the Joe's Witnesses rendered it. They took the word malach and translated it messenger. His own personal messenger, who is his redeemer, saved them. So thank you, Jehovah Witness, for admitting Jehovah has a personal messenger who saves and redeems Jehovah's people. Wow, Jehovah Witness, you just made my case easier. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? So does Jehovah have a redeemer, a savior whom he sends? A personal messenger whom he deploys to save and redeem? Yes. And what is that redeemer's name? Jehovah of hosts. Let's go to Isaiah 44, 6 in the Jehovah Witness Bible. And I'll tie it in with a New Testament passage and we're done for tonight, God willing. Okay. Isaiah 44, verse 6, Jehovah Witness Bible. This is what Jehovah says, the king of Israel and his repur repurchaser. Who's repurchaser? The king's repurchaser. What is his name? Jehovah of armies. 
I'm the first and I'm the last. There is no God but me. Revelation 1, 17, 18. Here's your proof that Jehovah has a personal redeemer, a personal messenger whom he sends to save, whose name is Jehovah of hosts, who's the first and last. Here you go. Revelation 1, 17, 18. When I saw him, I fell as dead at his feet. And he laid his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one and became dead. But look, I'm living forever and ever. And I have the keys of death and of the grave. Wow. Jesus says, I'm the first and the last who became dead and I'm alive forever. Wait, Jesus, you're the first and last? Yes. And you're the one whom the father sent to save and redeem? Yes. So are you telling me you are Jehovah's redeemer? Yes. Who's the first and the last? Yes. So you're Jehovah of armies? Yes. End of story. Sydney, if I have to answer that right now, I want to send you to another channel. Which part of I have topics on the Trinity in the Old Testament wasn't clear? The Trinity or the Old Testament? Surprise, JWs. Okay, I hope you got it. Folks, I need you to intensify your prayers and fasting for me. I need you to intensify your prayers and fasting for me because Satan is trying to hit me to try to discourage me. And he knows how to hit me because I love my daughters and adore them. And I want to protect them from any man in their life. And I need your prayers. Partner with me. Beg Jesus to keep my heart at peace, to let him go and trust Jesus to fight for them and vindicate us and bring us together. Because the more I do ministry, the more I get attacked. And he tries to use my daughters and their innocence to attack me. I just got a scathing message from their from their mother, my ex-wife, cussing me out for telling my daughters the truth about her immorality, her adultery. And she's now telling me, what makes you think I'm not married to that guy, Mark? See? An immoral relationship destroyed their marriage and divorced, sinning against God, and she goes in and tries to marry someone else thinking that God will bless it. I need God to show up because I'm getting tired of this. I need the Lord to remove this from my life. So I can focus on him and my girls and save them from her sexual morality and her godless unions for the glory of Jesus. I'm tired, saints. Pray God will sustain me. Pray God will protect them. Pray God will save them from irreparable damage. And then she's saying, I want to start a YouTube channel and, and expose you. Yeah. I'm scared. I'm shaking. Guys, I need you to pray because I can't deal with this drama. Ask Jesus to rebuke Satan. Ask Jesus to discipline her for her godless, immoral union with a man when she's not lawfully divorced and to let my daughters free from this godless example. I'm tired of mentioning it, but I need your prayers and your fasting because even in the message saying, see, you lost. You did this to yourself. God punished you. She still has the audacity to invoke God and that God punished me for her wickedness. Lord, have mercy on all of us. But I love you guys and your family, and I need your prayers. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Lord Jesus, forgive us, even forgive her and chasten her to fear you and never invoke your holy name against me and protect my daughters. Bless everyone here. Comfort them and fill them with your spirit. Fill me with your spirit. We love you, Lord Jesus. Give us the power to finish the race for your glory with integrity and save us from Satan trying to cause us to stumble. We need you, Lord Jesus. My daughters need you. Please hear our cries. We love you, son of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord willing, tomorrow around 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Lord willing, I'll be live for the glory of Christ. But I need your prayers and fasting. Scathing text messages because she wants to silence me from exposing her to my daughters to protect them from what's going on. But Christ is risen, risen indeed. We love you, Lord Jesus. I love you guys. For, the, for their sake, not mine. For my angel's sake that deserve better than her and even better than me. In Jesus' name.